Welcome to the ET Project, a podcast for those executive talents determined to release their true potential and create an impact. Join our veteran coach and mentor, Wayne Brown, as we unpack an exciting future together. Hello, I'm your host, Wayne Brown, and welcome to the ET Project. So for one of the first times you can actually hear me and see me say this introduction, we're delighted to be delivering this podcast for executive talent all over the world, and we're affectionately referring to as Team ET. Today, I'm flying solo. Why? Well, it normally means one thing. It indicates that we're going to be wrapping up our quarter, and in this case, that's quarter three for 2023. And therefore, today, I'm not traveling. Instead, I'm staying put, sitting here in my office in Shanghai. So. Wow, it has been an incredible quarter, hasn't it? I'm not sure about you, but the weeks, the months in this year, they just seem to be accelerating that little bit faster than usual is my feeling. My wife very unkindly says it's probably just an age thing. All right, so with that, let's have a look at our guest lineup this quarter. And as we've done previously, we're going to chunk it down into four blocks of three weeks. That means we're going to cover three guests each block um, so we can give you some chunking. If you haven't heard me talking about chunking in the past, then now you've heard the word. All right. Unlike what we've done in the past, however, this time we're going to be incorporating the promotion video trailer or teaser that we did with each guest just to save you listening to my wonderfully monotone voice the entire time. And I can hear a collective sigh of amen to that. All right, so our first three guests, Miss Sharon Rolfe, Mr. Eric Gerard, and Miss Joy Meserp. If you recall, we go all the way back to July, July 2023, where we first met Sharon. Sharon is our 75-year-old budding entrepreneur, and bless her heart, she's decided to help others through her coaching and community. And in fact, the people that she's targeting or focusing on are those people that are heading into retirement. So Sharon's well-placed to speak about this. Have a listen to her response to one of my questions. You provided a nice segue um, into the new community and the, the program that you're setting up called Loneliness to Resilience. So what, what's it about? What's the purpose behind this community? Well, I got inspired by reading last month uh, our Surgeon General's book. Um, Together was the name of the book. And he gave lots of examples how there is various times in our life being, you know, preschoolers and and primary grades and getting your first job or getting mm -hmm. um, college, How, you know, you got, you got to find yourself kind of thing in, in college. Um, and, and he moved to, he was from India and he moved to Boston. I think he was first in, in Florida. Oh, his parents moved to Florida. And then in his career, he moved to Boston because that's where his, uh, one of his first jobs was. And uh, all of the different ways that, either bullying showed up or, or that lost feeling or where yeah. do I belong? And, and I, I'm different. I, I don't fit in here maybe. And um, it really kind of tugged at my heart because I felt like I solved that problem when I was about 22. And right. uh, I, I was um, crocheting uh, an Afghan. I, ripple Afghans were in then. And um, I, it was a Friday night and I was crocheting on my Afghan and um, this, you know, critical voice came and said, well, sure, you're a young lady and you should be out there socializing, you know, you should go to the bars or whatever, be active with other people. And I said, wait a minute, I chose to be here. I, I kind of like my own company and I'm doing what I want to do here tonight so i kind of like go talk to somebody else scoop 
All right, so let's keep rolling. And next up is Mr. Eric Gerard. So if you recall, Eric is an L&D expert and is focused on helping young managers become more effective. And we chat about a whole raft of different interesting topics, um, including his guide for managing, where he outlines a number of the actions that new managers in particular can start to practice. Now, he's also, right at this moment in time, as we release this episode, he's also releasing his first book, which is called Lead Like a Pro. All right, so keep an eye out for it. I'm sure it's going to be a bestseller. Have a listen to what Eric shares during our conversation. The transition for many leaders today to conducting Zoom meetings like we're on now, to being able to connect, in our case, talking about facilitation. What, what have you found is the greatest challenge from a virtual perspective in trying to facilitate learning? The first thing that pops into my head is the technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's of course the fact that I'm trying to connect with you from a distance over, you know, over a camera, over the internet, right. you know, yeah. and you're in a different country. So there's all of that, but first principles, the technology I think is still glitchy. So I was just recording a podcast this morning with a woman who um, is in Mexico city and we had to start and stop eight times because she kept freezing. She kept freezing. And, you know, who knows where the problem was, whether it was in the software we were using, whether it was my end or her end or something in between. So I think that the technology still creates a bottleneck and those glitches, those hangups, um, differences in audio quality, differences in visual quality cause issues that then take away from learning and take away from bonding. Our third guest is Miss Joy Reserve. Sorry, Joy. Um, a seasoned leader with a great track record for creating workplaces where people really want to be and work. So much so that she's now branched out on her own to spread the word to all leaders about ways to make the workplace a joyful experience. And no surprise that her business is called Leading with Joy. So check out the insights that she shares in this short clip. It's never as simple as it may appear in the conversation. There is a lot of mm -hmm. work that needs to happen in the background to make this something that is sustainable. Have you had similar experience or what's, what's your feeling? Yeah, I think um, there's a couple of things that can help increase sustainability. Um, and that's part of what I bring in, in my programs. But so, so it's really important, I think, that when leaders see that someone is in that flow state and doing a fantastic job, that they intentionally slow down to recognize that individual. Right. And I said, slow down. <laughs> so that's where it takes extra time on that leader's behalf. I think so much of the time we can be like in our head, sort of like what I call nexting as leaders. What's next? What's next? Okay. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for doing that. And what you end up with is a bunch of empty praise for people. They're like, no, no, no. I said, thank you. I was appreciative. I said, thank you. But thank you is not enough. Mm. It's empty because it can come across as very patronizing. If that's all you're going to say about, you know, this, you know, months of work, it's, somebody doesn't have anything tangible to take away from that. They don't truly feel appreciated. And at, at our core, we all want to be seen and heard and valued, right? So, so leaders do need to slow down and take the time to intentionally pinpoint what it is that they're appreciative of and why. Um, and that helps sustain that culture. And once you teach everybody to speak that language, which is fairly simple to grasp, easy to practice. But once you teach everybody to speak that language, it's self-fulfilling. Everybody starts to do it with one another. And so peers are recognizing peers and uh, managers are managing up and managers are managing across and down and all around. And, and so this sort of, then you sort of have this culture that says, we appreciate everybody who works here. And that, and that is part of that fulfilling 
mm-hmm. environment, and culture um, will help you, even though, yes, it is hard to keep drive and motivation going, it will help that. Right. So that rounds out our first trio. Up next, the next three guests commencing towards the end of July 2023. The first guest was Mr. Steve Farrell, followed by Ms. Manette Norman, and then Mr. Mark Hodgson. So let's have a look, starting with, uh, with Steve Farrell. And it's not every day that I get the opportunity to speak with a successful Silicon Valley startup founder, a two-time startup founder, in fact. Steve's got a really interesting story that he shares about that period in his life and an equally interesting one with his decision to walk away entirely from Silicon Valley and start that not-for-profit organization called Humanities Team. We did this episode 57, I think it was about, oh, there it is, the date's on the screen, the 25th of July. So great conversation. Do yourself a favor, check it out, understand what Steve's up to today. Was there a specific trigger that said, you know, the pursuit of wealth is not something that I'm now interested in. I'm more interested in the pursuit of humanity and helping humanity. Was there a, a finite time or was this a progression? So this, there, were, there was a progression uh, and that was, was very much of a calling. Mm. Uh, let me share too, just so listeners and, and uh, those watching this, mm. you know, really kind of see the truth of what happened. It was not like I had to go live in a cave with a loincloth or something. Uh, you know, th- this is the thing is, uh, especially for those that uh, are currently have a conscious organization or they're transitioning into a conscious organization, uh, there's enormous potential uh, to create organizations that are going to grow into, into massive influences in their community and out in the world. Uh, where uh, real financial wealth is is generated, but uh, but uh, even more importantly, from my perspective, you know that we're 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 a positive influence in the, in the community in the world where where we wouldn't think of starting a GMO company or some media company that is uh, creating trouble, you know, in the particular country that we're in uh, that may be going against democracy, for example. Miss Manette Gorman and Manette. Um, during her career, she's managed teams right around the world and helped them to achieve success through what she defines as a highly collaborative and inclusive environment. So Manette has also just released her second book, which is a fantastic read. It's called Boldly Inclusive Leadership. If you want some, some good reading about how to become a better leader, grab that book. Here's what Manette had to say when we spoke. Okay, and rounding out our second group of three, as well as taking the halfway mark, I guess. So we're now up to guest number six. So this is our halfway mark, is Mr. Mark Hodson. And Mark's a marketing expert based in Sydney, originating or hailing from the UK. Um, His business focuses on clients who are looking to create their personal brand, but their personal brand as they become that second half hero, i.e. meaning they move into their second half of their career and they're looking to become more marketable as the individual and start their own business perhaps. So together with his book called Time to Shive, I'll say that again, I, I think I got it wrong in the actual episode as well. Together with his book called Time to Shine, he has some interesting advice to share. So please have a listen. How do we how do we create our brand? How do we really make such a a difference and stand out when it's such a crowded world? So what's, yeah, what's your thoughts on that? Do a lot of work in this area of personal branding and thought leadership. And I know, I know, I know, because I've been doing it for a long time, that it a lot of people find it very daunting and yep. and scary, and uh, therefore they never start. And they think, yep. oh, I'm not smart enough, or I'll run out of stuff to say, or I'll be if I try to put my head up in my marketplace, a hundred people will jump on me and say, who are you to say that? What do you know? I know more than you. And there's a, there's a whole load of uh, there's a whole load of um, 
sort of self-talk, usually uninformed self-talk that's going on in our heads that that, that, we, that we've got we've got to just kind of put to one side. Um, and the yeah you know, the because what the reality is people overthink this massively. They really overthink this. Um, and like most things professionally and in life, you know, you know uh, the essence of doing this well is to be is is is, is simplicity. And simple, you know, it's easy. And like most simple things, it's uh, it, it, it's uh, it, it's it's hard to do. Simple, do, simple done well is hard to do. Um, but the the essence of it is just to show up as who you really are, which is about being authentic. Mm-hmm. But it's also about just just you know just just being you. Which is, so you don't. I mean, I think again, this idea of a personal brand and everyone thinks I've got to create content that I've got to be a massive thought leader. I've got to be really smart. I've got to be groundbreaking. I've got to be you know kind of splitting the atom every every time I post something. It's got to be amazing, um, and that's completely not true. It's the what wrong way to think about it. Welcome back, and for the second half commencement, we have three more very interesting guests to join us. As you can see on the screen, we have Miss Brandy Dignan. We have Mr. Luke Warsfold and we have Ms. Claire Chandler. So let's start with uh, Brandy. So Brandy describes herself as an industry agnostic. Now, I'd not heard this term before I spoke with her, but it makes total sense. And based on her career, we have to agree. Not only does Brandy jump across industries, as she progresses throughout her career, but she manages to stretch herself further each time and reach successively higher appointments. She's currently CEO of one of the health organisations in the UK. And in her wake, in her legacy, she leaves a wonderfully strong group of teams behind her. Here's what Brandy had to say to one of my questions. So, how do you encourage as a as a leader, as a you know CEO of, of a large organisation? How do you personally go about seeking feedback on your own performance? So, I, I'm quite an open book, and so for myself, it's really important to just keep asking. Um, but I think more importantly, you know, you might not when you ask, you might not hear the right thing. So, it's about the the, the culture that you you build around you. Um, I I do share power a lot. Because I'm aware of the advantages and the privileges that senior leaders have, um, or others due to just their social status, status within organisations have, um, and and that can lead to um, an equal power share. So it's really important when I go into organisations or even in my own private life, you know, meeting uh, young people or whatever, to drop um, to drop egos. Um, and again, that's new age leadership, isn't it? so that there's power sharing so that people can feel that they can give you the feedback that, that you need. And that can be quite hard to do because as you well know, Wayne, you know, you sit in boardrooms a long time and if you're not, if you don't give yourself, and I don't know how celebrities do it because um, it's really hard for them, isn't it? When you're on the pedestal every time and then you've got to just bring yourself down. You've just got to have conversations with yourself to give yourself the space um, to, to discuss the need that you just need to, almost have a reflection of dialing yourself down and sharing the power around you for for others also to be able to have a voice um mm-hmm. and it's a skill that i you know i'm still learning i've, I've not mastered it quite well but still learning and, and hopefully that helps um from a, a step forward perspective in terms of feed, feeding back next up is mr luke walsfold if you're looking for a case study where somebody has succeeded against all odds then luke is probably the person that you're after Succumbing to a hostile, addiction-filled home and school environment, Luke has somehow managed to overcome incredible challenges and now not only overcome them himself, but he serves as a counsellor and is certified as a counsellor for other addicts suffering through their own nightmares. And he speaks regularly about the importance of self-awareness, emotional healing, and the power of choice. So please have a listen to what Luke has to say. I'm, I'm imagining mental health in general, but I'm imagining substance abuse or addiction is, is very closely tied to this. It, it's still not an accepted norm in society. So it's, it's something that we try and hide from other people, I, I presume, and therefore... I'm wondering what are the consequences when we try and internalize or we hide the 
addiction um, and we're not able to share it with anyone else, what, what are some of the effects that that triggers? Yeah, yeah. So when it comes to that internal pressure building up, I think a lot of it is about not having the self-awareness to understand this happening. It kind of happens in the background. Mm. Like me, when I was running my company, I wasn't really consciously aware of the stress. I just had bills to pay, a team to manage. I had the office to sort out. I had clients who were calling me. I had my business partner um, and our relationship to manage and lots of things going on. And you don't really have time to sort of stop and think. One of the big things that goes is self-care. So we don't have time to really take care of ourselves because we're running on this fight or flight at a million miles an hour with lots of high anxiety in terms of our mental health. Anxiety is a big emotion and also sadness and isolation. But those emotions are building in the background. They're just building up because of all these decisions we have to make. We don't really have time to stop and kind of think things through in terms of our feelings. It's like demands need to be met. There is a coronavirus or a recession on the horizon that is happening, and we need to make those decisions under the gun. There's not really much time to think about how we're feeling. And like I said, it's certainly not culturally acceptable to say necessarily in a meeting, let me just go and check my feelings, and then I'll get back to you on this decision. And that brings us to our final guest in this block of three, the third block, to speak with a lady in, I believe she's in New York. I'd have to go back and listen to it myself now, but Miss Claire Chandler. Claire specializes in leadership and business value creation, and she does this by tapping into nearly 30 years of experience in people leadership, human resources, as well as her own business ownership. And during our conversation, we explore some really interesting challenges that's faced by HR in connection in connecting with um, the operational side of the business. And we delve into some of the potential reasons that this may be occurring. Great conversation, and we've already agreed that we're going to continue into quarter four with this conversation, so keep an eye out for that. Here's a portion of the discussion we had together with Claire. I'm wondering where self-regulation fits in to this equation. So when none of us that I know anyway, myself definitely, we're not perfect. And even though we may have a self-awareness, we may have an awareness around some of our uh, shortcomings. And I'm wondering how do we incorporate self-regulation in those areas or should we? Yeah, I, I love that. So, so I happen to, um, as part of my work and part of working with leaders and with teams on this notion of raising their self-awareness, hmm. um, I use a suite of tools that were actually pioneered by Jay Niblick and were inspired by Dr. Stephen Hartman. Um, and, and part of what that helps an individual measure is not only their fast lanes, right? What they are uniquely talented at, but to your point, it also uncovers for them what's known as their blind spot. What are the areas that don't come as naturally to them that in theory they could do? They could learn how to become a little bit more proficient, but it's always going to be something that requires them to slow down and give more conscious thought and kind of causes a drag on their productivity. Um, and so your point about self-regulation, I think that is the other side of that self-awareness point, because right. it's not only important to to know what you're good at, but to your point, it's also to know where where you have, I don't want to say weaknesses, mm. but areas that are non-strengths. And if you spend more time in those areas, you're going to become less engaged. You're going to feel less productive. You're going to feel less fulfilled. And all of that has a has a ripple effect. Um, so yeah, I think your call out about self-regulation is a good one. And I think it's spot on. And now to our final trio to round out quarter three, all three equally gifted, interesting and insightful. And I have to say, it's one of the greatest enjoyments for me that I have the opportunity to speak with such a diverse collection of leadership talent. I feel so much more knowledgeable and grown up. It's, it's been an exponential development process for me and one that I really hope to continue long into the future. So here's our three in order of appearance on our show, starting with Mr. Christoffel Snyders. Um, Christoffel comes from, I believe, the Netherlands, but sitting in Spain. Miss Linan Weaver, who's over in 
Denver, Colorado, and we talk with a gentleman by the name of Mr. Mustafa Amar. Mustafa is currently, you know, I believe, in Italy, although his birthplace is Egypt. And um, you'll hear me say shortly that Mustafa carries the title of industry agnostic with one of our previous guests, Brandy Dignan. So interesting lineup, great conversations with all three. Let's get started by jumping across to Christoffel, and we speak about the three brains. Yes, in one person, three brains. They are the head, the heart, and the gut. And Christoffel provides classic examples to support how we use all three continuously throughout our day, whether in our own decision-making, with our relations, partners, colleagues at work, or our engagement at the office with our bosses, with our employees, with our direct reports, with our colleagues, suppliers, etc. I didn't realize it was as obvious as it is until listening to Christoffel's explanation. So have a listen yourself to our conversation and gain a better understanding. Do you have a, a feeling about where we are heading as humans for the future? Like with this new knowledge where we've got the three brains, we're learning how they, they can align and work more harmoniously and the, the impact that can have. The question would be, is it all too little, too late? as we head towards AI and singularity, um, or is it just in time? I'm an extreme optimist. If you look at our six, seven, ten thousand 10,000 years on this earth as human beings ever say more involved, as you would say, um, we had a lot of ups and downs. We had in the, in the Middle Ages, in, in Europe, we had the Dark Age. And we really were not a smart ass on that moment. We the, before that, we had the Roman Empire, we had the French Revolution. Now, I think we're not too late. Mm. The, we, we, I would say we're never, you're never too late. Uh, I, I love sports. You're never too late. You're never too late until the, the, the referee whistles on, on, on his thing as the game is over. The game is not over. Uh, artificial intelligence is freaking amazing. Like 30 years ago, the first chess computers uh, were launched, or maybe 40 years ago, and they would say, they will overtake the world soon or, sooner or later. Yeah. Chess computers are smarter than humans. Still, humans now can win from a chess computer, 40 years onwards. Eh? So IE is scary, but can be extremely useful if you use it the right way. Mm. And yes, jobs will get lost. Because if you, uh, if you would go, say, just imagine, you, have a, uh, you had a trial. You would go to a lawyer. Your lawyer around the corner, uh, did five years of law and is ten, 10 years in business, read a lot of books. And you go to IE, who read all the freaking books of whole your country, so all the law cases of all your country, and can give you actually which law cases would be beneficial for you. To whom would you go? IE. So your research done, research works done by IE. But if you're in sta standing in front of the jury, would you like to have a computer there or a person who can smell the room? Our penultimate guest for this quarter, quarter three, is accident survivor, Miss Lynn-Ann Weaver. Now, when I say accident, imagine having a car roll over your, over your legs, and you can imagine the result. Now, Lynn-Ann, while lying in hospital, realized that she could make a choice. She could either resign herself to what the doctors were telling her about her future, or she could decide to reshape that future to the success that she has made it today. An incredibly powerful account of what your mind is capable of when you have that self-awareness and presence to understand what's present, uh, what's possible. And Lynn as Lynn Ann says, just one more. It's her mantra. It's an inspiring story for all leaders that are working through their own struggles. So I'd really highly recommend, if you haven't heard or listened to that episode, please tune in. It's incredible how Lillian has bounced back from such adversity, such self-doubting, to become the entrepreneurial 
speaker, coach, business lady that she is. So have a listen to the conversation. You talk about habits, which which is foundational, I guess, to a lot of our performance. To change a habit seems like such a daunting process. How, how do you work with your clients to be able to help them stay the course until they have enough momentum to, to make that change? One of the biggest factors that helps in people actually creating that change is being able to determine why it's necessary to change. Right. And some of it is first identifying their why. Second of all is if and when you change, how is this going to help you? Mm. If you don't change and you stay the same, how is it going to hurt you? Yes. And then one layer outside of that, who else will it help if you improve in this area? Mm. Will it, it you know, help your team as a leader? Well, if your team's performance improves because your performance improves, how does that impact your customer satisfaction? How does that improve your customer retention? How does it re- impact your revenue and creativity and ability to build your business in the way that you're wanting? Or if you don't and you choose to stay the same, what are you going to lose because you didn't change? Are you going to start having more employee turnover? Are your team members going to become less engaged, not as attentive to customer needs or not as creative because now they're fearful Mm. of your response and they're not willing to take those risks to improve in the areas that you're really wanting them to improve in, to change the business in the direction that you want to make it. And now to our final guest of quarter three, Mr. Mustafa Amar. Mustafa and Brandy, as I mentioned, already share this title of industry agnostic, um, but I didn't tell you why. So have a listen. Mustafa has gone from his starting career, which was as a pharmacist, to a diplomat where he worked in the UN, uh, the United Nations, to an investment banker, then a coach, and now an app developer. It's such an insightful journey and conversation that Mustafa and I have, and he nicely articulates in his book that's called Time to Move On, the whole process about why it is possible to have such an incredibly diverse career by busting what he calls seven myths. So he's a serial entrepreneur. He's a serious serial entrepreneur that is probably only just getting started in building his empire. See what you believe after hearing out. If I look at the different industries that you move between, they're they're vastly different. So how much did that mindset that you had um, towards, I, I guess, transparency or being willing to ask questions, how much did that help you to make that transition? into those new industries? Well, I think in the beginning when I was transitioning to diplomacy, uh, I thought, okay, I'm doing diplomacy forever. It's, it's, it's my dream career. Mm. I'm not enjoying pharmacy. And this is where I want to be. It's a place where I serve my country, uh, where uh, I'm a silver servant, but at the same time, I'm doing an interesting job. Every single day is different. And mm. actually, it's a very great training for diplomat. It's like you get to do different things every single day. You know, uh, we always have a definition of a, a good diplomat. Is like you cannot say no for any task. You know, you really have to figure out how to do it. Uh, uh, so I learn a lot. Like, okay, how to do it? I, I never done it in the past, but I have to learn how to do it. Mm. Um, so that mindset uh, really helped me a lot. I, I work across different exp- experiences, like uh, from Malawi. Um, doing different kind of nature of work and then to China, to the UN. Uh, one day you do political work, one day a very high level visit, uh, two presidents are meeting and you are taking care of all the security uh, protocol issues and no one single mistake could be done. And then on the other side, another day, a cultural event where I, I was lucky actually even in China to use some of my artistic hobbies to train 
some kids, some teenagers, uh, right. they are deaf and mute, to dance on an Egyptian song. And with that, TME team, we've reached the end of this recap, episode 66. Hopefully this short reviews triggered some fond memories of our presentations, um, our ideas. Going back for a second listen might be well worth it. As we move into the final quarter of 2023, We've got another exciting 12 guests waiting to join us and share their stories, their insights, and their wisdom. So I'm really hoping that you're going to be there with us as we move through week on week. And we get started next week with Mr. Dave Goodall. He's a consultant who helps small to medium-sized businesses um, scale and grow. So Team ET, until then, stay safe and bye for now. Thank you for joining us on The ET Project, a show for executive talent development. Until next time, check out our site for free videos, ebooks, webinars, and blogs at coachingforcompanies.com.